Now let's look at how the EEG is recorded. Felix recorded the EEG from 27 standard sites according to the 1020 system. Some studies use more than 27 and some use fewer. How many electrodes should a study use? Well, that's another one of those questions with a two-word answer that begins with it and ends with depends. There are a lot of studies where all the analysis focuses on just one or two electrodes, like this time frequency study that I talked about in a previous video. However, if you don't have enough electrodes to cover the scalp, you might miss an interesting but unexpected effect. We actually used 32 channels in this time frequency study. In most cases, I'd say that 12 electrode sites would be the minimum, and I haven't seen many cases where there was any real benefit to having more than 64 electrodes. The one exception may be ERP decoding studies, which might benefit from having more than 64. Now let's talk about the nature of the electrodes. Each electrode is just a little pellet of metal encased in plastic. Just about any type of metal would work in theory, but most researchers use silver coated with silver chloride, which has some useful practical properties. The electrode pellet doesn't directly contact the skin. Instead, a conductive gel makes the connection between the skin and the electrode. This results in a more stable connection that isn't as easily disrupted by small head movements. There are a few systems that use a sponge soaked with saline as the conductor. This makes the electrodes faster to apply, so this approach is common in infants and small children. However, the data are usually noisier. Lots of companies are now producing dry electrodes that don't require a gel. They're much faster to put on and they don't leave a bunch of goo in your hair at the end of the recording session. People want dry electrodes for real-world applications like brain-computer interfaces. The data quality ends up being too poor for most laboratory research, but some of these systems are good enough for certain specialized applications like large-scale clinical trials. In a typical laboratory system, the outputs of the electrodes are sent to a device that filters and amplifies the voltages and then turns the analog voltages into discrete digital values. In some systems, like the Brain Products ActiChamp system that we use in my lab, each electrode has a built-in preamplifier. These are called active electrodes, and they give you better data quality. Now let's talk about digitization. The EEG starts out as a continuous analog signal, and this signal needs to be turned into a set of discrete samples that can be stored in a computer. This is done with a device called an Analog to Digital Converter, or ADC. We use the ADC to provide a measure of the voltage at a given moment in time, which is called a sample. For example, we might take a sample from each channel every 4 milliseconds. At that rate, we'd get 250 samples every second from each channel, so we call this a 250 Hz sampling rate. A sampling rate of between 250 and 1000 Hz is high enough for most cognitive and affective processes, which unfold over periods of tens or hundreds of milliseconds. But some sensory studies need a faster sampling rate, perhaps as high as 10,000 Hz. In either case, the sampling rate must be more than twice as high as the highest frequency in the data. Otherwise, we get an artifact called aliasing. To avoid aliasing, we use a special kind of low-pass filter called an anti-aliasing filter. It removes the high frequencies prior to digitization. You can see that Felix used a sampling rate of 1,000 Hz, one sample every millisecond and an anti-aliasing filter that attenuated frequencies above 260 Hz. The next line talks about the electrode impedances, so let's spend a minute discussing that. Impedance is a combination of resistance, capacitance, and inductance. It's the extent to which a time-varying electrical current is impeded as it travels through a conductor. To help explain electrode impedance, here's a blown-up diagram of an electrode contacting the skin. Your skin is covered by a layer of dried-up, dead skin cells that don't conduct electricity very well. Yes, that's gross, but it's true. And to make things even worse, the dead skin cells are covered by an oil called sebum, which is also a poor conductor. Electrode impedance is the impedance between the electrode and the living tissue underlying the layer of dead skin cells. In some systems, it's necessary to abrade the skin, lifting off the dead skin cells to create low impedance. Other systems, like our brain product system, are designed to tolerate fairly high electrode impedances. You might think that high impedance would reduce the amplitude of the signal, but that's not how it works. High electrode impedances just add noise, especially low frequency noise from skin potentials. If you're interested, you can read more about it in this paper that Emily and I wrote several years ago.